told him I'm the one for the job, no commas. And I'm serious, period, no commas. Wanna enjoy my family and my friends with no drama. And stack till I'm delirious, period. No, no. Ain't a dollar sign tag on some peace of mind, Jack. We could take a loss, we gon' get it right back. We could take a loss, we gon' get it right What's good, everybody? What's good? Welcome back to yet another episode of Off the Strength, where we're giving you the inside look into all things wellness culture. I'm a trainer called Tony, and of course, with me, I have some gentlemen of Extraordinary League. Guys, let's go around the table and introduce ourselves, please. K.R. Jones is in the building. Good morning. Troy Brooks is here. Peace and love. Your trainer, Corey. We got to let everybody know. We got the full squad in the house, so you know it's time to make some noise. You. you know it's time to represent. And everybody out there at home listening should know that this is a variety hour. That's right, folks. It's been a long time, but we're coming right back inside there. For my new friends out there, this is where we give you our best foot forward. So hopefully you take your best foot forward and you stride through the week making the moves that you need to get you into the place you need to be. Fellas, let's let the good people know what's going on. Large and in charge. Best foot forward. Make sure you get a pedicure. Hell yeah, man. Don't let that thing be yeah, nasty yeah. out there. I saw some people out here being a little happy about the warmer weather. Yeah. I saw some flip-flops mm. in these New York streets. Public service announcement. <laughs> Please take care of your feet. It's over. <laughs> but fellas, let's let the people know what you're doing. I know there's some travesties going out there with all the cosmetic stuff that you're talking about. But how are y'all moving? How are we going through? How can we get that inspiration for the people that might be out here with the dusty foot philosophers traveling around there? You know, look, got anything fun and new and exciting that you want to let the good listeners know about? I was supposed to have a really dope event this weekend, this mm-hmm. coming weekend, but, um, you know, COVID-19 is just out here being the worst of worst cop blockers I've ever seen. So uh, they're not letting the ship dock in New York City at all. So they made Virgin go straight back to Miami. I'm going to go ahead and let you know that that's not a tragedy, sir. That is a blessing. <laughs> if there is a virus going around that is as serious as everybody's been talking about inside here, the last thing you want to do is be on essentially what's a floating toilet bowl. Because that's what them things end up being. <laughs> it's like them ships be, yeah. they look nice, man, but I've seen a lot of people get retired on the ship. Young Jones, what you had going on, man? Man, it was a rough one, you know what I mean? But, you know what I'm saying, I struggled, made it through like the champion that I am, came out on top. Hi, right, Corey, I know you were celebrating the birthday. First of all, we got to make some noise for the homie yeah. Corey celebrating that birthday. Happy man. birthday, big homie. What's My going goodness. on? You had anything new, fun, and exciting going through the week? Officially hit 40. I found out a great revelation that 40 feels exactly like 39. There we go. So, okay. All of y'all looking forward to 40. If it's coming around the corner, just know it's 39 and then another day. There That's it pretty is. much where yeah. it's at. 40's cool, cool, cool. Yeah. 40 is the new Keep 40, right? Moving. Yeah, 40 is the new 40. <laughs> exactly what it is. We're going to get all these crews together, and we're going to have a good time. And speaking of a good time, folks, there's no time better than right now to go into this next thing. You know how we got to do when we touch down on this variety hour. We got to get into this whole show. We got to get this episode off right. We got to start off with this rip from the headlines now. Guys, I'm going to start with the good. We're going to go to the bad. And, oh, man, there's going to be some ugly inside here, okay? It's been so, a minute. I'm ready. It's been a minute. Like mud fence ugly? It's been a minute. Listen, this is ugly, okay? And it's Like dude I, from the Goonies ugly? I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go with the good first. I want to start off. Sam Cassell ugly. Sam Ooh. Cassell is a different type of ugly. That is a wild <laughs> ugly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to skip past Sam right now. We're going to let Sam live because we're going to start off with good stuff. The best of intention inside the world, folk, is always to start off with the good. So I know you guys inside the room have friends, family, and clients that you even had that work in a restaurant business, right? Of course. It's one of those lifestyles that can be pretty taxing for people that don't know about it. It's long hours. You're eating all different types of crazy things, especially if you're in the chef side. Kyle, I know we share a chef that we've trained and a couple of different sommeliers and things like that. So you know how their lifestyle is impacted by what it is that they're doing. And if they're having health or wellness concerns, it's kind of hard because on one end, they're trying to work really hard to outdo the thing that they love doing. And you always end up getting into a situation where a lot of these people end up having burnouts. A lot of these people have things that ultimately end up taking them away from both of the loves that they have in their life. And I've seen and had some friends actually lose a lot to it. So I was happy to hear that a lot of restaurants are starting to move towards a greater wellness awakening and starting to do things like have before service starts mindfulness practices or wellness retreats and even encouraging people to have different types of incentives to come in and make wellness a dynamic part of their lives. So I'm seeing childcare services come up. I'm seeing a lot of different things that are really trying to make the hard knock side of the restaurant world a little bit more accessible to this whole fit thing. So an article from the New York Times, Kim Saverson was one of the first in North Carolina is saying that she was donating at least $300 for each one of the employees who were actually active inside of their wellness regime. And I wanted to get some ideas as to one, how do you guys feel about 
restaurateurs and people who are, you know, coming into these professional chefs and these high class A list places now starting to see wellness is a real thing. If we're going to be serving you at this high quality, we need to make sure that everybody that is doing this is invested in themselves also being of high quality. I mean, the reality is your employee's time is super valuable. And anytime you can get people to be more efficient, more effective, happier, more productive, all of those kind of things, then it's going to be beneficial for the business itself. And obviously, I'm going to be supporting anything that has anything to do with motivating people to move and to get you know deeper into their wellness. So when you get a situation where it's mutually beneficial, then it's, it's the best thing possible. You got a win-win right there. I'm here for it as long as it remains authentic in its intentions. So if it stems from a place of I want the best out of you so you can give the best you have here, Mm -hmm. cool. If it turns into a thing where it's you got to attend this class before work, like a a prerequisite kind of thing, like I feel like that's not necessarily going to help. But if the intentions are pure, I'm I'm all for it. Yeah, and the enforcement side of it, Kyle, is coming from – the positive. It's not negative reinforcement, meaning that I'm not, if I miss out on this, it's only hurting me because I didn't get to participate in it. I wasn't sure if penalties or something would be associated with that. That's what I'm saying. Well, they're not penalizing, but they are incentivizing. So Katie Button is a woman who owns a few restaurants out in Ainesville, North Carolina. And $300 a month is going into extra for people who are participating actively in wellness, who are taking up dental practices, who are going up and seeing regular psychiatric therapists, who are not only subsidizing it because they're covering you in insurance, but saying, you know what, you went the extra route and I could see this happening. I want to pay you more for your time because your time is valuable. That's awesome. A- any place that's celebrating the individual like that is a thing that many other industries need to look at and try to template that. Troy, what you feel on that? No, I agree. I, if you're gonna if you're gonna invest in yourself, you've now become a commodity to my business. So I'm gonna further invest in you. If you feel good about how you feel about life, it's gonna transition to what you do in your job. You can right. get better at your job. Nobody wants a lethargic waiter. Nobody wants the waiter that's angry and moving yeah. around and like, yo, I'm yeah. ha- I'm angry about being here and giving you your food. Yeah. How good is that food gonna be? Or the waiter that looks crazy. Right. Yeah. Used to be back in the day, like you wanted that fat, like looking like he about to die, chef, because you know that was the one who was in there hooking. He's it eating. Up. He's gonna put yeah. his foot in it. Yeah. yeah. Now that we're trying to live a little bit longer, you know what I mean? Yeah. You yeah. know, a little yeah. less gravy yeah. on the yeah. venison. Yeah. Let's go ahead and do this. Yeah. yeah. And it's impactful, man. And we don't pay attention to the things that have these cyclical kind of impacts and the things that kind of you know, cascade over time, right? And we always have to be able to tune in and check into what's going on inside the body. And that, unfortunately, is going to take us into the bad for this week because everybody's checking in and we're looking into the body because a lot of people in this industry are scared, guys, because this coronavirus thing, kind of like we were talking about at the top of the hour with Troy, is a real concern, especially in places that have high contact areas, especially in places where we are really communal and we're going back and forth and brushing against people all the time, which makes it a perfect storm for places like the gym. So in an article from USA Today, I'm seeing trends that already have started happening since the coronavirus has made it over to the U.S. You're seeing a downtrend in people going to the gym and an increase in in-home workouts as, a, as compared. Now, you guys saw some of this reaction. Can you give us a little bit about what you notice inside gyms or what you notice moving around? So I've had a lot of clients come in contact with me and say, hey, look, we can change my schedule right now because I have, I'm working from home because they shut my, my office down. So there's a lot of people working from home. There's businesses that are down or completely shut down from people coming in and out based on fears of spreading the coronavirus. I had a lady reach out just yesterday via email uh, canceling because she said she was nursing a newborn and she was like, I can't come to the fac- I can't come to the facility and risk getting sick. So it's it's like a thing, like yeah, a real thing for but sure. It's I get that we need to worry about something and I get that people have to be a little concerned, but we're talking about something that doesn't have a high death rate as far as the numbers in the United States. It's not carrying anything close to pandemic numbers. 50,000 people a year die from the flu and less than 100 people have died in this country from coronavirus, but we're changing our economy because of it. Pay attention to the economy change, and I'm going to put a pinhole in that because I want to bring that back up inside later in the story. But if you understand the latency of the illness, meaning that two-week wait period, that's the thing that is, I think, of most concerning. So, like, the flu doesn't have that long of an incubation period, mm-hmm. right? You know that you have it, and you'll start to feel those effects, and you'll be like, oh, this person has a flu. You can keep them away. Mm-hmm. The fact is that I know I've worked in high-end gyms, I've worked in middle gyms, and I've worked in low-end gyms. This virus can live on these surfaces for a lot longer than most people can anticipate. So if you're not diligent about how exactly you're cleaning all of the equipments, and if you're not using the right type of cleaning solutions, because it's not just the regular wipes, you're talking about 
something that has a little bit more power behind yeah, you, it. You need the, the antimicrobial you need, stuff. Yeah, you need not, the hospital grade stuff. The ho- exactly, the That's hospital, the medical grade. Yeah. Right. Can you confidently say that most of the managers that you know in the industry, and we know a lot of these oh, managers wow. who are ordering supplies, equipment, all the rest of that kind of stuff, how confident are you that they're ordering the right type of equipment? You know, have to, to help. To I know I right am. Now. That's you. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? And my people are. Yeah. Exactly. And I can't facility, say that for everybody. In my facility, we, we run a pretty tight shit. Right. And that's that's what I would hope everybody is doing. But I know there's many spaces that there are inside of New York City. I know that people are touching the equipment and people are touching the obvious areas, but are they touching the other surfaces that might not be uh, monitored? Are we looking at the door handles? Are we looking at all the rest of these Sink things? Handles. You know they're out here cleaning, cleaning stuff with Windex if they run out of cleaning fluid. Are we like, wiping down the iPads? Are we wiping down the, the headsets? Are we using the everything. same rag to same clean everything? Because I, I know what I've seen, mm-hmm. right? And I've seen somebody on, on different staffs, and not to vilify any one particular individual, I know not everybody has the same standard of cleaning. Absolutely. Now I want to go back to what you were saying about the economic impact, Corey, because mm-hmm. the shift that's happening between the in-person and going into the digital side this wasn't the only thing that was sending that shift in that direction. And you do see the markets are oscillating as a reflection of what's going on inside this coronavirus thing. So the markets are down. Now, I don't know if you remember all the different signs and scenarios that we talked about last year in terms of what brick and mortar spaces are going to have to contend with in this digital space. I want you to look at this date. I want you to remember this date and see there was already a match stick away from having something really impactful happen on this industry, right? So the kindling was there, right? It was just dry and it was ready for something to happen. Pay attention to this long-term effect because the secondary impact of this is going to be the impact that I think far exceeds what's going on right now today. Please do pay attention to that. I won't go into it deeply, but if you were paying attention to the last 118 episodes, folks, I've been forecasting some stuff that it's only a matter of time that it's going to come back through. And I've always told you that when there is something good there's something bad, and now we got to get to this damn ugly. I'm always surprised at the way that people will actively go above and beyond to literally put themselves in danger. But this was even shocking to me. We just got off the story. We were talking about the coronavirus, something that can legitimately kill you. And we talked a little bit earlier about off the mic where some people just have nothing bothering them and they have to go out of their way to find some Mm -hmm. stuff. In an article from Insider Magazine, is talking about the danger of new fitness influencers going through different types of fast. And this fast this time is a water fast. And this fast is not just for water, a dry fast altogether drink more water (laughs) the movement (laughs) is trying to prioritize you cutting water out of your diet entirely so you just want to go into full dehydration here so i want to just stop and and really say that again right people are electing to detox water from their lives i don't know where i can go from here in terms of trying to save people who are actively looking at water as the thing that's keeping you away from getting where you need to get. Mm. Guys, what in the fuck is yeah. happening in this industry? Uh, that's <laughs> uglier than the third hyena. I'm trying to tell you, this is this is some ugly stuff. <laughs> what the crooks of this argument is about is people are going in favor of drinking, quote in quotations, water through eating more hydrating foods. So cucumbers, things yeah. of that kind of ilk. But you melons. can't melons, cucumbers, fruit only diets or and then going through days where you're completely dry. Right. The people who are doing this, if you look at them, you could see in every way, shape or form that they are essentially starving themselves. Yeah. They put starvation in a different package. And because it has all this bohemian chic stuff around it, they're encouraging anorexia yeah. just straight up. Yeah. I'm looking at it. I don't know what else anybody else wants to call it. This is a new spin to it, and this is something that all of the actual nutritionists are warning against. Please do not do it, but it is picking up steam. It's something that I can't even begin to wrap my head around, where you think that you can cut something out of your body that your body is mostly made up of. Absolutely. 60%. I am I am confused. <laughs> Y'all might disagree with me on this one, but I'm for this. Because if you are stupid enough to do this, die. You just got to thin the herd. Darwinism, die. Just <laughs> die. We need less stupid people because stupid people get smart people killed. Yeah. So yeah. we might keep a couple good folks because some of these dumb people just go. Man, Dehydrate, they... rot, turn into a prune <laughs> and a raisin in your house, die. Yeah. So you're not trying to be on the whole food water diet, Carter? No, I That's support not... it. I support it for you. Do it. Everybody who wants to do this, do it. 
good day. If you do this, you're you're wreaking havoc on your metabolism, your your joints, your muscles. You're going to a state of a catabolic state. You're you're atrophying. You're you're gonna look like a fucking cotton candy in a starving mouth. So I don't know what it is that you're trying to do, but this is just really really bad, and it's dangerous to see that this is what's going on. Social media, I always say it's a gift and a curse, but. We have too many fucking chefs in the kitchen at this point, man. Like, too many people out there miseducated, giving out information that is very high risk. This is this is bad. They're perpetuating the fact that they are essentially dying. And it looks cool because they put a bunch of other st- stylistic stuff around it. But it's like, you, you're you barely staying alive. You, you, you found the most minimal way for you to stay alive. And it was like, yeah, this is, this is the diet trend now. <laughs> I put this in the category of... The kids that was eating the little bleach things. Yeah, the pods. Yeah, the, we need the people them. that was. They should have gone too. In the grocery store, licking the ice cream and putting it back, like all the, all the, the people bullshit. Who was spraying bleach, bleach in their mouth to prevent the virus. I need all of them to do what Corey said, and uh, you you keep doing that. Let me know how it works for you and us. We just not going. This we not going to play no this, is, this is straight up kidnap kidnapping and ransom training. Like, when else would you fucking need this? Seriously. Her shoulder and her elbow were the same it's size. It's the same size. That's not okay. Your Every shoulder head. and your elbow are not supposed to line yeah, up yeah. like that. That's two different joints. That's crazy. <laughs> when your leg and your arm are the same size, you need to stop. We need to have an intervention. Please. Whole yeah. body's in a permanent cramp. Mm. She needs water. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's sad, man. It's sad who, to see. I don't know who gets What's the us? end goal? I can't rationalize something that's irrational. I do see people that look like they are hurting. I wish them all the best in the world. Yeah, uh, and I do hope that they get the good information to actually talk to an actual nutritionist we're gonna move out of this and hopefully everybody that is succumbing to this please gets proper information please validate that information make sure you're getting it from the right type of source and just like anything else when you're checking around the source does count it does matter and you need to understand that in life you have to have people who can give you proper information and you got to make sure that you keep the crown fully polished Mm. and you got to make sure that from the top to bottom you have your whole life situated in the right way so we're going to switch out of this rip from the headline segment into crown down what's going on troy the crown down today is inspired by one of my favorite favorite blogs slash podcasts i'm gonna shout these guys out earn your leisure two really really smart strong black businessmen who are just acclimated and giving good information to general population people on how to get their finances together how to make smart investments and also just understand what's going on economically and what's going on in the market and they had two chains on um on as a guest and it was two chains is basically speaking about what's going on in the music industry as far as a lot of these artists who just have no understanding of the contracts that they're signing until it's too late right uh, having no representation, having their fucking mothers, brothers, cousins, aunts, nieces, and uncles as their representation. And it's cool to have these people close to you because you love these people. But if these people are not put into place, they don't have the business structure, they've not signed the deals, they don't understand the verbiage of these contracts, again, you're trying to put this person in a good place, but you are not setting yourself up for success. So when I was listening to this article and 2 Chain is speaking about how he had, when he had first signed one of his deals early on, he had no idea what was going on. But as he started to get better in his business, he was maybe, he was able to be in Inside these rooms. So when it came to conversations about royalties, things of this nature, when he just got the new dudes, uh, they called it like true. Is true. It? It's like the it's a it's like his collective. It's a little right? collective. So basically, what he did with true was he made sure that when he was in these rooms signing these contracts, that they were in these rooms understanding, and they might not understand everything that's happening in that moment, but at least they're in the room to have a, a, a an opinion or an idea of where their life direction is going, right? Mm-hmm. So I was able to put a direct correlation between this and exactly what's happening in our industry, in our spaces of wellness. I mean, I can tell you 10 to 20 different applications that have online platforms with streaming and people are signing contracts with no education as far as to what they're signing, what revenue shares look like, what splits look like, what they be, what they should be paid hourly, and then what they should get on the back end. And then, you know, even fitness professionals who have no idea about having lawyers and, and why they need representation when they're signing these things. Because just like Meg Thee Stallion and all these little Uzi, Uzi Vert and all these people in, in the music industry that are going through these these fucked up situations because they... They, they saw their leverage too late in the game and that they were not educated on their contracts, in my opinion. So I think it's really important as fitness and wellness professionals that, like you said, we got our head on a swivel, that we're paying attention, that we're having lawyers in place for these contracts, that we make sure we're reading over the verbiage, that we don't just jump out the window and be happy at every fucking opportunity that comes our way. You're going to end up on that Barry Gordy Because you're going to end up, that's what I'm trying to say, man. So, I mean... That's really uh, what I wanted to get into. And then I wanted to kind of frame an open conversation about understanding, even at the 
base level of coming in this industry, you got to have some kind of leverage, right? Like there's some leverage. I mean, at bare minimum, like cultural currency is a thing, right? So understanding that and how to operate in certain spaces and the value that you bring to certain populations. So Kyle, I think the question that I wanted to frame to you in this is, I understand the story of your of your leverage with your company, but I think a lot of people don't understand how you were able to have leverage and what that looked like and how you were able to boss up in, in the company that you work with. So can you speak to us a little bit about that? I think it's important that you understand your value, first and foremost. So your value doesn't necessarily come in monetary form, but it can come in cultural currency. It can come in a presence. It can come in a voice that you have. It can come in... Whatever it is that you can bring to the table that no one else can bring. So whenever you're in a deal, it's always, I'm the person that you need. Here's why. This is how much it costs. Let's talk about it, right? And that's kind of the mindset you have to go in. I can't stress enough the idea of having someone in your circle who has done it before. Either they failed at it or they are succeeding at it, but you need that person there or at least advising you along this journey it's not a self-made thing like oh i I can do this myself i built it up from the ground and it's like yeah you're gonna be broke by yourself Mm -hmm. too Mm because people gonna be eating off of you Mm -hmm. so it's important that you have your knowledge of value knowledge of self and knowledge of that advisorship around you of people that have done it before because that's very important so you didn't walk in day one with that as a demand Nope. You couldn't. Nope. And that also reflects the nature of the relationship between you and the entity that you're talking about. Now, if you go back and listen to that Meg the Stallion or any of the G- uh, Gerbo mm-hmm. or the Blue Faces yeah. and all the rest of these yeah. people, where were they when they were making that first contract decision? Okay. Independent. That means it ain't no major label. Me and my mama. My mama used to answer all my emails. My mama was my manager. My mama was my rock. My mama was everything. It was just me and my mama rolling around this hoe. So if somebody's going to tell you, and I'm coming out of some town in the middle of nowhere, that I have talent, I have all these things that everybody around the block is selling me, celebrating me for, and I've never actually seen $10,000. I've never seen fifteen dollars all at once. Maybe nobody in my family ever made $30,000. I'm coming from this space, that type of desperation. And somebody says, you know what, I'm going to give you $30,000 for you to make this track. And you can be signed for me. We're going to go 60, 40. By the time you get to the percentages and everything that's inside that actual contract, you just heard $30,000. It's like, yo, I'm, re- I'm ready for that. I'm, I'm just like, yo, my rent is only $500. You know, you're going to give me $30,000? Yeah, I'm going to be okay for my time and my period right now. That's a sufficient answer. So I can see why people short sell themselves. That's really what you're talking about. No, no, no. I, I can too. I can see why they short sell themselves. But then I, I also, the pushback that I would give to them, at least if you got good people in your corner, no matter where you come from, you can come from West Bubba Fuck. Hopefully there's good people there, right? And hopefully these good people are on your side that could be like, hey, listen, you might be worth a little bit more than that. And you've been eating peanut butter and jelly for a long time. You could probably do two or three more months with peanut butter and jelly before we get another deal on the table. That's you what you should. You don't always have to take the first thing that's thrown at you. And what hopefully people get from this conversation is that, right? Because, you, 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 listen, you might have the one person who's been broke forever that gets that 30K opportunity. And because of this conversation, now they might say, shit, you know what? If these people are offering me 30. Maybe I'm worth 50. You have to – you earn yourself in and then you have to take that risk. So you exactly. short your contract. You decide I'm not going to give you five years. I, I I can't get any. I may not be able to get anything better than this because I don't have that kind of leverage. Mm-hmm. But year two, year three, we need to change this up. Absolutely. So when you come into those situations where you believe in you, earn that right. You need to go get it. So you have to shorten your relationship sometimes and try to get the shortest contract possible. A lot of times those publishing deals where they give an mm-hmm. artist a million dollars. I don't care who you are. I don't care how much money you come from. A million dollars is a million dollars. Roy said that. Mm-hmm. A million life. dollars is a million dollars. So a lot of times the perspective is, so when you're talking about like 30 grand from someone from a podunk place, cool. But listening to me now whatever money you have a million dollars is going to affect you so that's the kind of money they put in sometimes but then you don't realize that how much the industry costs how much is going in and how much comes out the same thing happens to trainers you go oh i'm about to get 75 dollars a session or whatever then you come out and start adding up what that really costs i gotta get there transportation Transportation. i still have overhead there's other things that go in that's why a lot of times I tell people who are relatively new in the industry and say they want to jump out, 
calculate your overhead first. Just don't just take your clients and the numbers that your clients are running out and think, oh, I'm going to jump out here. I'm going to change my split, and now I'm going to run. I'll mm-hmm. be fine. There's different overhead involved. Your taxes are now different, and that tax situation change is very, oh, very different. Oh, crazy. You know crazy, what I'm talking crazy. about. Absolutely. So there's a lot of different factors that come into play. So sometimes the bad deal is a bad deal, but it's also the only thing that makes sense because you haven't earned the right to get the better deal. Yeah, yeah. You got you to gotta take – sometimes you got to take that deal – and mm-hmm. use that deal as a harness to get in the next deal. That's that's the reality is a lot of times people jump too soon. Yeah. And I, I took a decade of planning and yeah. learning. Yeah. And then when I saw the pivoting and brand, just like Tom was talking about, you see the climate. Yeah. I'm in box gyms going, this ain't the move. This no. isn't what no, we're no, going to. No, Let me, me learn the trust boutique me. side. Pivot. Same. Let me learn operations and boutiques. Same and then here. did that. Same. Tony, you're on the other end of this thing as you've jumped out of training years ago to get more into the corporate wellness side. You interview a thousand places. When you're going into spaces like this and you're looking for contracts, what are some of the non-negotiables that you think you need within that space so that maybe people that say, hey, listen, I've been listening to what Tony's talking about. I think I want to go in this direction of corporate wellness. What are some of the things that you're looking for on these contracts that people might be able to benefit from today? You know, it's going to be a variable thing depending on what the location is, what the opportunity is. But what I will say, just to go back to a lot of what you were alluding inside there, I know what my tolerance is more than anybody else's is. And I know that I got a different type of energy. I'm built different. And I know I know my value that I bring to any of those ventures that I go out into. So I'm looking, I invest my time like I'm investing in a portfolio. So if it touches wellness, I'm going to put my time, my sweat equity, my, my thoughts into the different verticals that I think have a clustered effect. So if I'm paying attention to one side of the market, it's because I know the impact that it would have on the other side of the market. Mm -hmm. Now, I see the contracts come in. They might be favorable for the thing that they're paying attention to. Mm -hmm. And whether or not I decide that I'm going to take a loss on that or I'm going to have an upside to it, I may or may not have a little bit more malleability Mm -hmm. on that side. Right. But in no way, shape or form am I ever entering in a negotiation where I don't know my value. I don't care how they see who I am. Mm -hmm. I know what I'm bringing to the table and I know, okay, you're focused on this small facet, okay, cool, let's get this to be the biggest possible part. But when I plug this into all the rest of the stuff that I'm doing, it's going to have much more impact further down the line. And that often is, that's a test Mm -hmm. to where you're going to go and how far you're really going to be about getting into that. All right, I know I can have this conversation now that when we have to renegotiate, it's because I already knew what talent, what time, what energy, what everything I, I had to put in. It's no real. It's no real yeah, shot once absolutely. we have to have that conversation yeah, because look yeah. at what I've already showed yep. you, and now look at now. By the time you see the full size of the mountain, mm-hmm. it's already too late. Yeah. So now you got to get on board with the thing that was moving too fast, right? So that's that's my approach. But I can't tell you that that's cut out for everybody because I well, know you build differently, bro. Fam, ain't nobody gonna go as deep as I'm. But gonna if go. they could just get ten percent, if they could just take ten percent of that, yeah, moving in the right Betting direction. yourself, yeah. bet on yourself, and if you really do put the time, energy, and effort into your talent, it'll be fortuitous in the long run. <laughs> way that you invest your time is important because we talk a lot about being busy Mm -hmm. instead of being effective. So when you invest in yourself, make sure you put some time and energy into those investments and you put some equal amount of planning into that. The what you take to make sure you understand your things, make sure you know what you're doing, make sure you know the different steps that are involved in the process of getting to where you need to go so that you're not wasting time just focusing on the things that you enjoy. Because it's very easy when you try to get into anything of self-investment, whether it's entrepreneurship, whether it's just personal development on another step forward of sticking to the things that you're comfortable with or the things that you like doing rather than the things that are actual weaknesses so that you can perfectly improve. Know your weaknesses. Work on those weaknesses. Know your value. Keep good people around you. Yeah, it's pretty solid. You need any more information, you got to pay for it. Elevate their lives. Raise the bar, so to speak. Hell yeah, man. Keep it going. So, Full steam. You know, when it comes to raising the bar, certain gentlemen I know from the Shortenary League who has the right information, K.R. Jones. What up? stage. My man. So the interesting part is we are always in alignment. So I want to start off with a quote. Did y'all happen to see Burner Boy in GQ magazine? I did not. I did not. So Burner Boy was in GQ magazine, and, and he had a quote that I think ties in perfectly with everything we just talked about. This quote says... Unlike a lot of other people, I had to go through never-ending steps to get here. Whereas other people have taken the elevator up, I've always been too heavy for that kind of elevator. So I had to take the stairs. Now I know every floor and everything on every floor. 
I like it. Yeah. I like it. I mean, being as though we record on the 10th floor and yeah. I've seen us all take those oh, stairs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we've all looked at everything that hey, is not, in this building. The 6th floor is wild. The 6th floor is wild. <laughs> you know, but I, I just I wanted to start with that because I feel like that ties in that yeah. conversation of understanding what you're getting into Absolutely. and understanding your worth, your yeah. value, uh-huh. how heavy you are. Well, People, you, gotta... you can take up space. What did Jasmine say? Yeah. There's space out there. Take up take more up of space. it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So with that being said, I want to jump into what has had my mind in a frenzy is hmm. this Royce the Five Nine album has raised yes. the bar yes. <laughs> for me personally, Bars. and it's just like on so many different levels. So I want to unpack these levels a little bit. So I'm talking skits. Are you a buyer or a seller? A seller. If I gave you a million dollars right now, would you buy a candy or a candy store? A candy store. What is the goal to be? Independent. If you lost everything tonight, what you got tomorrow? Intellectual property. And what is intellectual property? They can take possessions, but they can't take your mind. I'm talking feature placement, and I'm talking production, right? So the skits were... Very important and noteworthy. You have the Dope Man skit, the Ice Cream Man skit, Mrs. Grace, Grace Mr. Grace, the Eminem skit, the Rhinestone Do-Rag skit. Like, (laughs) I've never had an album where there were so many skits that were needed, but they didn't take away from everything. Part of the whole project. Everything added to. The features were there, and the placement of a feature is so important because sometimes I feel like, especially when new artists are out, they get higher or more popping artists to make their song pop and every song was like no this is this artist's song but i'm adding to it even more right so it didn't feel or sound out of place um soulful beats ad libs was crazy the transitions in between songs were crazy the storytelling was next level so troy yeah i know you was listening to it absolutely what song spoke to you from the allegory so i'd have to say there's there's three different songs I don't age is crazy to me. Um, I think I play. I don't. What is it? I don't. I play forever. It's really dope. And then what's the one with West Side Gun? Overcomer. Overcomer. Overcomer is crazy. Overcomer, Overcomer is, is crazy. The, yo, the production on Overcomer is crazy. I didn't see where he was going with the angle after after West Side went off, and that shit hits super hard. I think these three songs are crazy to me. Um, I'm a huge Graf fan. I've always been a huge Graf fan. Shout out to Graf. He just dropped Oracle 3. He went crazy on that song. It just gives me a feeling. Like, these three songs, it's hard to pick between the three because I know we speak about, like, toxic positivity and all kind of shit and yada, yada, yada. But there's there's parts in my life that might be toxic um, that I'm just not ready to give up. And I like I like rap. I like, I like shoot em up shit. I like street rap. I like bars. I like dirty gritty music that just invokes a feeling in me and i think those feelings are important because i'm able to operate in spaces that weren't designed for me based on the fact that i come with something different i just have a little bit of that that edge that grit in me because i come from those environments and this music just invokes something in me that i think is important you ain't got to feel it but i like you know what i'm saying of course and i think that to that point it not only invokes and elicit things from you, but it also educates you as well because there's so many hidden messages. Yes. Now, Brother Tone. Yes, sir. They describe the allegory as having a story with a subliminal meaning that is a political message based upon what's in the writer's mind. For sure. Now, I know you listened to the album. Did you pick up on any messages in particular? I think Royce was making a statement throughout all of his career that you guys didn't pay attention to how good I was, so I'm going to go out of my way and show you how good I was. If you look at his interviews that kind of circulated around the press run that he was doing inside here too, he made made sure to note that you knew he did some of the production. He made sure to note that the references to him being a he goat, all the, all the production, bro. Put an asterisk next to that because there's some some <laughs> questionable things yeah, as to yeah, how, how yeah. he did that. So I'm gonna give him credit for some of the production. <laughs> you got it <laughs> until I know actually who was sitting in the booth yeah, behind him. Yeah, yeah. As but, the producer, you got yeah. it. Yeah. Sir. So yeah. if you could make a call to Primo and be like, "Yo, does this sound good?" I'm gonna give Primo some some cred on that produced beat. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, you got to play the cards that you was dealt. He no, just no, had no, a really good cards, right? Absolutely. But the fact that he wanted to have that level of touch, that level of yes. detail, that level of execution, that level of this is me personally going through I'm not going to come up with a concept for album I'm going to give you my expression and it's going to be random but it's all going to make sense by the time I get to the end and I am the greatest of all time he keeps saying it he's wearing the ring he's going through all of it he's telling you that he feels this way so in that as a manifestation story 
Yeah, that allegory is pretty clear. He's like, I created this. Yeah. I'm here to compete with this. I'm mm-hmm. with the new guys. I'm with the old school guys. And I feel like I could be right inside this presence. And I'm not mentioned where I feel like I should be mentioned. It's one of those things where he just, he really dived in deep. And I feel like, uh, not for nothing, Corey, uh, he, I know you got a chance to listen to the album and he talked about his dad a lot. And I know you spoke about having that conversation with your father. Is there any music that you got from him or any correlations you made between your relationship with the music and your relationship with your father? Dope, man. Because of the way the old school music came in, the only time there was music in my house is that I enjoyed because my mom listened to like show tunes. And I'm just not here for the hills are alive. You know what I mean? So, And my father didn't really play music unless it was just us. So when it was just me and him in the house, which wasn't that often because, you know, my father was a Wall Street dude. He was mad busy. Even on the weekends, he was usually doing something. So when we got to hang out, it was like really good time. And we would just chill. Like my, he, it was the only time I ever just chilled because I was always running and, you know, in the street doing something physical or whatever. And the time we would chill, he would like play a little music and he would tell me about the old days or like, some, and I would ask him for advice. And he's always been like that sage dude. And there were parts of Dope Man. Dope Man was full of transitions. And the, the music transitioned. You went back and forth from a little bit of narrative back into it. The Even the, the, the cadence of the lyrics and the way it was delivered changed throughout the course of it. And obviously the premise was talking about the local Dope Man, but also making a lot of different parallels and metaphor references to it. And I remember a lot of things that my father told me I didn't realize was extremely extremely acute advice that I didn't understand at the time. And I think a lot of Royce and Royce's delivery and Royce's greatness, we a lot of people don't understand. He's one of my top rappers. Mm-hmm. And I think this shows how great he is. Absolutely. And people who know rappers, rappers know that yeah. Royce is a killer. Yeah. But a lot of people don't because he hasn't made a lot of heavy popping mm-hmm. moving unit tracks. That's not his thing. That's not what he does. But he is great. And I think that all of that came through in the information that I got from my father that greatness can be defined differently. And you, if you believe you're great and you decide you want to be these things, then it doesn't matter what the rest of the world has for you. You're still your goat. Yep. I literally played from start to finish, no skips. And I just appreciate y'all fellas vibing with it as much as I did. And I feel like it just brought me to a moment, if you will. And in that moment, I'm always in search of some clarity. Yeah, we go. So with that being said, Brother Corey, sir, take us on the journey. All right. So first and foremost, I want to thank God for granting me this moment of clarity. I want to speak to y'all about sex. So first off, I want to talk about your view of sex, your idea of your sex and your sexuality. And I remember starting off young Corey. When young Corey came into the game and started off, sex was like a conquest. It was like a thing I didn't understand. Everybody was trying to get it. Most people were lying about it. Because you know when you're the young dudes, you're on the bus. Everybody lying and saying they, they hooked up with somebody and messed with some shorty. And most of us was lying. Yeah. So when I finally got there, I realized, hold up. First off, the dudes in the back of the bus were saying stuff that's not happening. Like the, Y'all was lying the whole time. I These thought descriptions this stuff was ain't up. Yeah. I was like, hold up. But that, that's not even where that thing is. Like, y'all was wrong. I came back with new info looking at them different. <laughs> As you get, you, I got older, I started to realize that there's, there's different aspects about it, and a lot of the things that I was nervous about, because you're nervous, like, well, you know, am I going to be the right kind of lover? Am I going to do the right kind of things? And then you realize it's just about understanding someone. It's just about mm-hmm. sharing a moment. And sex is one of the highest forms of touch. And don't overlook the the transfer of energy, the possible transfer of powers, the control, the submission the sharing in that interaction and even the situations where it's not necessarily forefront about emotion, you're not doing it necessarily to create a connection. There is a connection at that time. And that's one of those things we have to acknowledge because it affects people. So when you look at what you're doing with your sexuality, you have to remember that if your intentions don't necessarily align with what you're doing, you should reconnect that. If your experience with sexuality isn't fulfilling you, you should figure out why it isn't and change that. And if it's not fulfilling whoever you're having sex with, then figure that out as well. There's a lot of communication that we tend to lack in life and in general. And we talk about how our our relationships are disconnected because we have 
connection through technology. So connection through touch, connection through interaction becomes laxed. And our society is affecting how we look at sex. And sexuality is being used to create profitability as a marketing tool. And we're losing the fact that sexuality is supposed to be an intimate and personal thing, even if you're not trying to do it for the purpose of a relationship. So you have to acknowledge that there's something there and explore what that means to you. And when we mention exploring sexuality, we talk thoughts and actions and we drift to the physical side, not the psychological side. The core root of what drives you, what arouses you, can really tell you a lot about yourself and a lot about the person you're with if you choose to listen. It's another avenue of self-reflection. It's another portion of wellness that we tend to leave out because it gets uncomfortable. And the reality of it is if we don't talk about it, it's another thing that we will neglect. So I challenge you to take time to understand and share that information with your partner, partners, whatever you have going on, whatever the case may be, and really start to understand yourself and understand your sexuality. And the question I want to pose to you gentlemen is, how did you transition? I'm going to start with you, Troy. Of all the you, you, you've gotten through <laughs> Well, because you've gotten through all the steps in a way. You've gone through the, the, the beginning of like, yes, you know, yes. how sex starts. And now yes. you found your partner. Yes. So now you know the person you're going to have sex with for the rest of your life. Yes. So I, you, you, you got it all right now. So you okay. got all the information. <laughs> got so talk to us about that, that beginning, Troy, yeah. and the understanding of your sexuality to yourself now. Beginning phase of just understanding my sexuality, period. Yes. A uh, very, very sexual being, um, very in tune with what I wanted from a sexual experience at an early age. Uh, I didn't lose my virginity. I'm not going to lie to you guys. I didn't lose my virginity until I was probably 16, 17. Okay. Um, but when I did, I wasn't like a young hopper. I didn't want to just run around fucking everything. I wasn't dry humping pillows. Like I was still very intentional with who I chose to give my body to because I think I had a very high level of self-value. I didn't want to just give myself to everyone. I still, at a young age, wanted that experience to be something that was valuable and something that had value. So um, I think that's continued to transition. Obviously, we go through these phases. We go in relationships. You break up. You go out there and you wild out. You have a bunch of partners, yada, yada, yada. But I think all of those different elements uh help me transition back you know like you said what you say you make a couple lefts and then bring you right back to where you got to be three lefts to get you right back three, where you exactly start. so yeah, i think right. I, I think that the three lefts <laughs> in my intimacy life that took me right back to my core credo of uh um, valuing who I am and valuing my level of intimacy. Uh, we brought me to marriage and being with the one person who I'm with where uh, we know each other's love languages. We communicate openly about touch. Um, it's not always about sex with us. It could be in the same room. It could be holding pinkies. It could be touching each other's sensual places, just being in the room. And because we have a child and we're not always able to be intimate, it's very, very important that when we we, we have all these different moments to connect and feel that high level of intimacy. So, um, and, I'm, and I'm blessed to be able to do that with someone that I love. So, it, so it's, it's real. That's dope. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Yo, Kyle, as the spiritual advisor and the, the deep yoga bendy 200 hour understanding <laughs> how to move bodies, person in the spot. When, when you really started to get into your yoga practice, how did that affect your understanding of your sexuality? It got to a point where uh, I am a mythical unicorn of sorts, <laughs> and I have to be aware with who and I shall cha- I shall share that moment with. And for Tom's sake, we're just not even going to get into all that right now. You know what I mean? Just, <laughs> that is that is not the space that we need to be in at this moment. There we go. That's how you keep yourself from getting indicted on there. I appreciate the hell out of that. My man, Corey, I just put it out here like this. I used to do it for sport, putting up the numbers, getting the names and all the rest of that kind of stuff. And it transitioned to intentionality. Much like everything else inside of life, I need to be intentional by how I share that energy with anybody. And you have to make sure that you do make those reconnections, kind of like you guys were saying going through there. Is my intention getting me to the destination that I want to get to? And if it's not, maybe you need to change. Maybe you need to reevaluate. Sometimes compromise is good. You shouldn't compromise on certain things, particularly inside of sex. And if you are a much more, let's say, liberated person than somebody else might be, I've had that play out where that urge is never going to go anywhere. You know who you met when you first signed up. Is that person still there when you get to the different phases when you're trying to go on that journey, when you're trying to matriculate through that space so that hopefully maybe you're working into the right direction? I'm in the learning process now, still trying to figure that out. I don't know if I honestly was ever a monogamous person. I'm a polyamorous person who did monogamy pretty well. 
And I'm still trying to figure out the way to make that happen in a realistic aspect, work without having anybody be hurt by that. And the level of truth that you need to navigate that correctly isn't something that a lot of people really want to deal with all the time. I think fundamentally what it comes down to, wrapping up everything that we've gotten on the information we've gotten from all y'all is essentially understanding and being truthful with what you know and making sure you reconnect to whoever you are with is the important things in that. Hell yeah, man. I thank you for sharing that moment of clarity, brother. Thank God for it. There we go. Fellas, this has been an exploratory episode. I hope everybody got something that they needed. We learned a lot about everybody inside the room coming across, and I think we got some good direction. How y'all feeling on that? That's a wrap. Oh, man. So. There we go. <laughs> Once again. Wrap it up another. like a first date. Yeah, you better. You make sure you stay strapped. If you're going to be you jumping yeah. around out yeah. there, Corona ain't the only thing you could catch. Right. You got to let them know. You better be safe out here. Hey, stay wash strapped. Hands. <laughs> wash your hands in other spots, too. Watch it all. <laughs> yeah. Once again, it's been another fantastic episode of Off the Strand from a trainer called Tony. K.R. Jones. Trey Brooks. Your trainer, Corey. Peace and much love to y'all. Until next time, we'll see you soon.